in years to come, that a 10 years of a tremendous statesman, someone we owe a deep debt of gratitude to, for the, the modernization, the foundation on which Gordon Brown will be building for the future. We see the, the family leaving as well with Mr Blair and Mr Blunkett, and we shouldn't forget that the last decade has imposed tremendous strains on them. Enormous strains, because obviously this has been the first family with children for a very long time, the first children ever to go to state schools, incidentally, uh, under a premiership. And Sherry Blair in particular has received a terrible drubbing in the newspapers, almost hate from one or two of the, the editors and senior staff, and I think she'll probably go out with a, a degree of relief. And uh, just a final thought, Mr Blunkett, on the challenge for Gordon Brown. Well, the challenge is, is a, a big one because Britain faces globalisation, the modernisation of Britain and its equipping to cope with rapid social, cultural and economic changes is, is a very big one. But here's a big man, here's a, 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 a successful Chancellor, here's someone with a clear leadership style and a vision of where he wants to go. And I think we're going to see that over the months and years ahead. Mr Blunkett, uh, good to talk to you as well. Thank you Thank very you much. You. David Blunkett, the former Home Secretary there, and uh, his thoughts, not just on the end of the Blair era, but of course on the challenge for Gordon Brown. So the scene is set in Downing Street. Any minute now we are expecting Mr Blair and uh, his wife Cherie and maybe the children too to appear on the doorstep here in front of the famous door of number 10 and uh, say farewell to Downing Street for the last time as they head off for a new life and uh, Mr Blair probably he heading off for a new role as Middle East envoy representing the European Union, the United Nations, America and Russia, what we call the quartet, representing them in the Middle East and trying to get that Middle East peace process back on the rails, which is no mean feat. And lots of people, of course, questioning whether Mr Blair is the right person to be able to do that, given the fact that Iraq has caused such a huge controversy. Anyway, that's a debate probably for another day. Here in Downing Street, we are just being told that Mr Blair is saying goodbye to just a few people inside the door in that kind of lobby area. And I think that uh, that's the traditional thing. People will line the corridor, which uh, leads from the front door down to the Cabinet Office, and they will say their final farewells. And I would bet a lot of money that lots of them are in tears. Ten years is a long time, and of course the relationship between the Prime Minister and the staff in Downing Street can become very, very close indeed. We saw it at the end of the Thatcher period. We saw it too at the end of the major period. And uh, it's, it's, it would be wonderful to see the pictures inside, but understandably that is a pretty private matter for now. They should be out in a few seconds. Why don't we join John Sopel again with John okay. Prescott? If we get any movement in Downing Street, we'll be straight back, John. OK, Hugh, yeah, we'll be watching that black door very closely indeed. But let me bring in uh, the Deputy Prime Minister, uh, John Prescott. I'm still right to call you the Deputy Prime Minister. Yes, for a little while longer, I think. And there's a little gap in between us. Who knows what can happen? You may be in charge. <laughs> That'd shake a few people, wouldn't it? <laughs> so what do you feel today? I'm very happy. Tinged with sadness, of course, but I think we've had 10 years, we've had a good run, we've been very privileged, we've delivered on what we promised, and I think the House of Commons showed on both sides he's been a great Prime Minister and our privilege to serve with him. You're not normally a man prone to sort of great shows of sentiment. What did you think, though, when there was that sudden standing ovation for him? Oh, I thought that was tremendous. The House of Commons showing what they thought of this man, really. Whatever's said in the press, great respect for a great Prime Minister, and that's what he will go down as. And um, no sentiment, no, get on with the next job, but um, a wonderful ovation for him. You've had your very public job as Deputy Prime Minister. You've also had a private job, which is at times to have almost been a mediator between Gordon Brown and Tony Blair when things have got difficult. Was that frequent? On occasions we had dinners, but that was quite normal, really, to have a discussion about matters, and I'm pleased to have, uh, be involved with it. It was a great privilege, but I've been a friend to both of them, because at the end of the day, we're working for the country as well as the Labour Party, and we kept on track for three elections, so it seems to have worked. On occasions we had dinners. I think that's probably a bit of an understatement of what went on there. Well, I was a waiter for ten years, so I could help in the situation. You know, you get the conviviality of a meal and a discussion and an agreement and on course to deliver as we promised. And now, after ten years, it's worked. 
Right. Now, what do you think the difference will be between a Blair administration and a Brown administration? Well, I think they'll still be governed by that phrase I always use, traditional values in a modern setting, and what we have shown that no other government has for a long, for a long time. Economic prosperity and social justice, that is to get people back to work, a stable economy and investment in our public services. Gordon Brown has been an essential part of that in the ten years. I don't think that's going to be changed and I think we'll see another successful period of a Labour government under Gordon Brown. But do you think there will be differences? They're, they're very different men. Of course they are, but I mean, it's the principles and the values that Gordon talked about and Tony talked about, which I've tried to put together as the traditional values in a modern setting. That allows for the change. God blimey, even, even the Tories talking about conservative principles now and meeting the modern circumstances, so perhaps they've even pinched one of my policies. Yes, but isn't that the challenge, in a sense, that you've got David Cameron, very telegenic, very attractive to the voters out there, a new sort of start for the Conservative... Be very attractive to the guy that's just resigned. I think the thing he said, you couldn't understand where he stood or anything, he didn't stand for any principles, so he has the image, but he doesn't have the substance. That'll be the charge against him, but who can doubt whether Gordon Brown's got the substance? Just look at the prosperity we've had in ten years. Now, what about Tony Blair as Middle East envoy for the Quartet Group? I mean, a lot of people would say, after Iraq, after his support for Israel in the Lebanon war last year, he's not the man to bring peace to the Middle East. Well, I understand what you mean by that, but they said that about when he started on Northern Ireland and Mr Paisley made a tremendous tribute to him. A man who keeps on going, keeps his eye on the ball and eventually is able to persuade people. And I think in Israel, I know, and Palestine and the two-state solution, he's always felt strongly about that. He did hope more would come out of the Iraq situation and the agreement with Bush. Now he's going to have a good opportunity and if he can do for that part of the world Palestine perhaps we can be bring peace in that area and if there's one man who's got the courage the conviction and the patience it's Tony Blair uh, John Prescott you've talked about how you see the 10 years in terms of the prosperity and meeting the promises that you kind of you've probably you if I asked you to you'd probably still find yeah, you your, don't want to bring out your, your pledge, pledge card, card yeah again. I knew yeah, you'd have your course. pledge card I mean if I you'd invited you'd have me your to do it there, there it lots, is lots of money delivered as well, on it and I'll be here going round in the next couple of years making that point time and time again. Right. But you say you produce your pledge card, but yep. on Iraq, isn't that what everyone is going to be remembering the Blair years for, above everything else? Well, I think, of course, it's a very important issue. And, I mean, the Prime Minister made clear how he felt about that today in, in his final speech, almost, to Parliament. And it will be remembered, but people will remember what he's done also. He did what he thought was right. And I think there's a general feeling, given the circumstances of when that decision was made, hopefully we can come to some kind of peaceful arrangement out of Iraq eventually. But at the end of the day, he was courageous, he made a decision, and no doubt that's very much in people's minds, but history won't judge him on Iraq. History will judge him what he's done in this country and what he's done to help in many other countries. I wonder whether you and other cabinet ministers wish they'd held him to account a bit more, wish they'd pushed it a bit harder in cabinet when the decisions were being taken to support uh, the invasion of Iraq. Well, we had lots of discussions in cabinet and indeed parliament had many discussions about it. There was all this argument about whether we'd got the correct information. But at the point in time we supported that policy. We don't run away from it now. I have the privilege of course of sitting on the sofa and talking talking to him and you can be sure I can express my concerns about that. But that was a united government position on that matter. We went into it, hopefully to bring democracy into Iraq and that's still our hope and our aim. Uh, one other issue that I suspect you don't look back on with great fondness, that was how you raised the money to fight the last general election. You promised that you were going to be white and white, you are going to be transparent. You introduced legislation so that donations have to be declared and then you start taking loans that don't have to be declared. Well, I think that whole matter's still been under investigation. You wouldn't want me to comment on that either. I'm not talking but about the police investigation. I, I'm talking about I the know, loans. That's what's it generally in people's minds about that. But parties, all parties, have received donations, often from wealthy people. And I think to that extent it has been part of it. But I think there are a lot of changes coming on, some we've already done, more to come, I'm sure, as Gordon Brown has said, to actually deal with that. But I've been a supporter of state financing. I prefer to have the state financing where you know where the money comes from, people understand it, and it's transparent that that's the case. And I'm still advocating state that, finance. That's interesting. So no money from big business? 
no money from the well, unions. I think you can make conditions. We've gone down to how much money. If somebody gives a thousand pounds or five thousand pounds, a hundred thousand pounds, the connections that have been made about honours have made it very difficult. But I do believe state financing is by far the better way of dealing with it. But not only just giving the money, making sure we limit the expenditures. Too much money goes on press advertising and advertising at the present stage. Let us get some reality into the expenditure and some reality, of course, into where the money comes from. And that's what the National Executive of the Party has been doing and will continue to do. You, you've, t you've talked about the money spent on uh, advertising. And I was talking to one of the, the ministers who's tipped for promotion to the Cabinet uh, who was saying, we've been too fixated on the media as a government and maybe that will change under Gordon Brown. Do you think that's true? Absolutely. I think well, you been, have been too fixated on the media. I think the media plays too much part. I think Murdoch plays too much part. I think all these media barons, look at the guy who bought the two guys who came from Jersey or something, was it? Uh, the, the Jersey Islands and actually bought the Telegraph. Look where the change of the Telegraph. They kick off the good journalists, bring all the pro Tories on. We've always had to fight against the You weren't the saying Murdoch's too powerful when you, you know, when you were still I've in office and it. had to get. I, I've always said it. And don't say me you don't say it. I've never been happy about that relationship, whichever political party, and they're all in it. And the media have that influence. OK, John Prescott, Quite thanks very much. As well. OK, John Prescott, very good to talk to you. Thanks very much. Hugh, that black door still hasn't opened. No, John, that's absolutely right, but uh, I'm told it will with the next few minutes or so. Um, the final farewells are still being said, and it, it's understandable that these things don't exactly work exactly to time, because um, people may have some conversations, and uh, these are very unusual meetings and moments, to say the least. The crowds have gathered, and uh, very soon Mr Blair will leave Downing Street with his family, make his way from here over to... Buckingham Palace, they'll drive down the Mall, uh, past the crowds there, and they'll make their way to the big courtyard and the King's staircase in Buckingham Palace, and then they'll be off, we think, to Sedgefield, Mr Blair's constituency. And after that, we expect Mr Brown to be summoned to the palace and for him to come back here to Downing Street uh, to announce that he has been asked to form the next government and that he's accepted that task. and Mrs Blair leave Downing Street for the last time. The children are left at number 10. They won't be making the journey to the palace to see the Queen. Mrs Blair will uh, accompany her husband Tony to see the Queen for that last audience as he tenders his resignation. And now the constitutional process is well underway. We are now witnessing the handover of power in that brisk British way of ours because once the resignation has been tendered, there will be an immediate phone call to the Treasury to summon the next Prime Minister, who, of course, will be Gordon Brown. A rather interesting departure, moving. Mr Blair and uh, Mrs Blair embracing their children, as if to say, thank you for the past ten years. Leo, of course, little Leo was there, not here in 97, but very much here now. And... Uh, Mrs Blair, in a very direct message to the media, 
I was slightly disconcerted that she said it almost directly to me. We won't miss you at all, she said, as she got into the car. James Landale, our political correspondent, is with me here. James, I think she meant that. She did. Uh, she has, to be fair, been on the receiving end of quite a lot of uh, negative media coverage over the years, uh, famously over na the, the nanny gate issue. Uh, and uh, clearly she wanted to get her, uh, her final word in and she used it uh, directly and to the point. And Mr Blair obviously wanted his last words to be in the Commons itself and not here in Downing Street. Yeah, that was a deliberate strategy. He didn't want in any way to have whatever he said overshadowing anything that might be said or not by the Chancellor when he comes back as Prime Minister in, uh, within, we expect, within the hour or so. James, thanks. The Prime Minister is on his way down the Mall, past all the flags that have been there since the Queen's Birthday Parade and the Falklands Parade uh, a few days ago, on their way down to Buckingham Palace and there'll be a, a little switch over there, we expect. We expect the Prime Ministerial car to stay in Buckingham Palace for Gordon Brown to pick up after he's uh, seen the Queen. Nicholas Witchell, our Royal Correspondent, is there. Nick, um, I'll hand over to you for the moment. Well, the last Prime Ministerial convoy that Tony Blair will travel in, approaching the Victoria Monument there, people gathered watching these last moments of Tony Blair's at times tumultuous ten years as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. The vehicle now turning in through the gates of Buckingham Palace, a journey that Tony Blair has made on many, many occasions during these past ten years to attend his audience, but on this occasion with his wife coming in now through the archway and into the quadrangle here of Buckingham Palace. And in a moment the car will sweep around to the King's Door and we will begin the first stage of this process that, of course, we haven't witnessed for ten years since uh, one Prime Minister came to Buckingham Palace to resign. That was John Major then and another man, Tony Blair, as was the victorious Prime Minister in that general election, came to be asked to, to form a government. Being greeted there by the Queen's senior lady-in-waiting and an equerry. And they will now go in through the King's door. Mr Blair will be greeted by the Queen's private secretary, Sir Robin Janbrin, who will take him up to the audience room while Mrs Blair waits in a room downstairs. And up in that audience room where the Queen has been waiting, uh, he will explain to her that he is resigning as Prime Minister. As I said earlier, there are no seals of office for him to give back. The Prime Minister does not have any such seals of office. It's expected to be quite a short uh, audience of the Queen and then Mrs Blair will be invited to join them and they will, uh, I'm sure, spend a few moments just talking about uh, their plans now, possibly this Middle East job, perhaps uh, the trip to Sedgefield and his retirement as MP. And already out here in the quadrangle we can see that the police are preparing just moving the cars or preparing to move the cars because we would expect him not to leave in the Prime Ministerial uh, Daimler, but to leave in another vehicle. Uh, Tony Blair will, of course, still have uh, security for many years to come, and he will require that security, but uh, already the, the reins of power are starting to shift. So by now one must imagine that he will be up in the uh, audience room with the Queen, and that process of this transfer of power will have begun. And perhaps it's a remarkable thing that in a country such as ours, which goes in for so much uh, uh, ceremony and uh, uh, panoply of, of, of uh, such things, the uh, actual transfer of power from one Prime Minister to another depends, as I said earlier, just on a few words being spoken uh, by the Queen. First, she accepts the resignation of the one Prime Minister, and then in perhaps uh, 10 or 15 minutes we will see the new man, Gordon Brown, arriving here at Buckingham Palace to be invited to form a government. Nick, thank you very much. We'll be back with you, of course, as soon as uh, the Blairs emerge. Uh, Nicholas Witchell, our Royal Correspondent, explaining that this audience is not expected to take that long, but, of course, the audience with the new Prime Minister, Gordon Brown, should take longer. They'll have more to talk about, and the Queen may well express an interest, of course, in the kind of Cabinet that we're likely to see. Watching the pictures with me, our political editor, Nick Robinson, who's joined me now in Downing Street. Nick, just a quick word about the remarkable session of Prime Minister's questions we saw. Yes, extraordinary. We expected him to try and swat away a fifth Tory leader. The Labour benches were desperate for him to do it. He had his prepared gags. But David Cameron socked the politics out, congratulated him, and the whole session was like that, so it ended with an emotional that's it from Tony Blair, a gulp and a standing ovation from all sides, all men and women of all politics. We've never seen anything like it. He going with that dignity, but a little sign 
that you were commenting on, Hugh, that Cherie Blair still doesn't quite forgive as she left Downing Street for the last time, mouthing to the camera, we won't miss you at all. And I saw her going into the chamber to watch him. I wished them well, you and Blair. The children smiled. Mrs Blair looked rather daggers at me. How was that dynamic going to change with Gordon Brown, the, relation with the relationship with the media, certainly? Well, it's great at the moment, isn't it? There's a change. The media likes to have novelty. But what we know is that Gordon Brown can be a difficult man, and when it, things are not going well, I've no doubt that, like with every Prime Minister, he'll complain about the media, the political weather, if you like, as they all have. Nick, many thanks. Stay with us. We'll be back with you in a short while. If you've just joined us on BBC One and on BBC News 24, we are hosting live coverage of the handover of power between Tony Blair and Gordon Brown. The one o'clock news, by definition, has been delayed. It's now 20 past one, but let's join Sophie for the rest of the day's news. Yeah, thank you very much and good afternoon. There are fears that a fifth person may have died as a result of the severe flooding across England. Emergency services are using heat-seeking equipment to search for a man who's missing in a dike near Doncaster. This morning, two more rivers have burst their banks in Nottinghamshire and people in the town of Retford have been told to evacuate their homes. In a moment, we'll be hearing from Robert Hall at Catcliffe in South Yorkshire and from Rajesh Merchandani at Upton-upon-Seven in Worcestershire. But our first report is from Danny Savage, who's at Tolbar near Doncaster, where the army has been brought in to help. Well, Sophie, this is the main street in Tolbar, a village on the A19 just north of Doncaster. Local people tell me that 80% of the houses here have been affected by flooding. It started deteriorating the situation at about 3 o'clock this morning, and ever since then they've been trying to cope with the rising water. It may have stopped raining here more than 24 hours ago, but for the 1,200 or so people who live in Tolbar, the full horror and misery of the flooding has only become apparent in the last few hours. There's, no, there's nothing you can do. I mean, you, um, you don't want to cry, but my house is just a, just a mess. Well, it's just unreal. It's so surreal. You can't believe it, really. But so Just get on with it and make the most help as many people out as you can. A combination of groundwater rising and a beck bursting has meant hundreds of people have had to be rescued. This heavily pregnant woman was given priority by a fire service rescue boat, one of many people moved to a local leisure centre. Others have had to wade out or are still trapped in their homes. And the people here have been told the waters are still rising. Danny, give us the latest on the search for this man who, it seems, has fallen into a dike somewhere. Yeah, that's happening about just a mile or so from where I'm standing at the moment. They've got boats in the river at the moment uh, with police divers trying to search this swollen river Ebeck. Uh, it appears that a local woman heard a man or a boy shouting in that river at about 11 o'clock this morning. And ever since then, we've seen helicopters in the sky nearby and emergency service sirens as they try and search for this missing person. But still no, no person found yet uh, on that ongoing operation. And elsewhere, the army has been brought in to deal with what potentially could be a pretty serious situation. Yes, there's a size of an old power station here at Thorpe Marsh. Now, there at the moment, there's an electricity substation, and the army have been brought in to sandbag that uh, uh, substation, which has been threatened by the River Don bursting its banks. And because that station supplies a lot of the electricity to the whole uh, area around Doncaster, so they've brought the army in to try and make sure that this substation stays dry, but it seems to be like an island at the moment, surrounded by water. Danny Savage, thank you very much. Well, in South Yorkshire, hundreds of people have had to spend a second night in emergency refuge centres because of fears that a nearby dam could burst. Some of them live in Catcliffe near Rotherham and our correspondent Robert Hall is there now. Robert, what's the situation there? Well, Sophie, uh, on the floodplain of the River Don, uh, little perceptible change. The water levels here, unlike uh, downstream at Doncaster, has been some improvement. You can see how little, though, from the edge of the water there to this line of debris just in front of me. That's really all that we've seen while we've been here since the early hours of this morning. Uh, all around the region, the clean-up and damage assessment has begun, but the skies have been dark, rain has been falling, and it promises to be a third miserable day. Hour after hour, street after street, this clean-up is painfully slow and often back-breaking work for the council teams who've struggled here through continuing traffic chaos. It's really hard, shocking. Wow, it's very hard. But, uh, I don't see it as bad. This is Kellam Island, a centuries-old industrial area alongside the River Don. 
The water levels here have fallen, but whole trees are still embedded in bridges and the lanes around the office blocks are covered in stinking mud. At the Kellam Island Brewery, every drop of beer has been contaminated. It will take weeks to restart production. We've had, you know, pubs say we, we don't care about the condition of the beer, just get it to us. We can't have the regulars without it and obviously we can't, we can't do that. Across South Yorkshire, so many questions. How can communities and individuals recover? How could this happen? The flood has stirred old debates over the wisdom of building on floodplains. After the past 48 hours, those voices can only get louder. Well, that debate, of course, continuing, but to people around here, there's just one priority. Those that aren't at home to get home and those that have managed to get back home to try and get their homes into some sort of habitable condition. And to add to their misery, so many here just weren't insured for this. Sophie. Robert, thank you very much. Well, let's go to Worcestershire now, where the threat of more flooding is by no means over. But in some towns, flood barriers have helped to limit the damage. Rajesh Merchandani is at Upton upon Seven. Rajesh. Sophie, thank you. Yeah, here at Upton, they've had full flood defences in position since about Monday night. They sort of come as flat pack kits. They're quite easy to put up, but they're not particularly cheap, so you've got to weigh up the cost and the benefits. The rationale is basically how much uh, risk of flooding is there to local properties, and look how close these properties are. I mean, already the water here is coming up sort of near the top of my wellies. It's about a foot, but let's just take you a bit wider. Take a look over here. This is actually the River Severn, and look where it is. It's burst its banks, and it's coming up to this level. I'd say that is about a metre difference, and what's holding it back? It's the flood defences here. So the people of Upton are very pleased that these are in place. In Worcester, the Environment Agency decided they didn't need to put flood defences in there. I've been there today. Take a look what happened. It's a different kind of final furlong. Canoeists take pleasure at Worcester Racecourse, under four feet of water. The floodplains of the River Severn are submerged. Roads cut off, businesses not working, people frustrated. The city's flood defences were not deployed. Last night at about 6.30, there was one lorry offloading a few sandbags uh, here, and obviously that was an inadequate response. I think it's messing up the race course. There's business lost there, there's business lost over there. A um, lot of wildlife gone, I should think. don't understand why they can't just build a three-foot uh, mound of earth along there, which would stop all this, I'm sure. The Environment Agency says their priority is to protect people and property, not highways, and that the situation in Worcester is totally unprecedented. Here's why they think that. Just downstream, where the Severn meets the River Team, the team is so swollen, it's causing the Severn to back up. Authorities say they didn't expect the waters to be so high, but try telling that to flood campaigners. So do you think they made a mistake, the Environment Agency? Yeah, I do think they've made a mistake. I think, you know, they've got an awful lot on their plates, but, and they had to make a measure, just judgment, and I think on this time, this time they've slightly cocked it up. It's a difficult decision to make, as it costs many thousands each time flood defences are used. Even here in Upton, there is some flooding, despite the barriers, but what would it have been like without them? Well, the question everyone wants answered is, what's going to happen next? In Worcester, the Environment Agency say they think what happened there was a fully localised event which should have no knock-on effect downstream, which means here. They think the river is levelling off, not rising anymore, but steadying. Uh, they are pumping out cellars here, but one shop owner told me she'd noticed that the level was actually going down. But it is raining, more is forecast, and as ever with this story, we'll only believe it when we see it. Sophie. Rajesh, thank you very much. And thank you again to everyone who sent in photos and videos of the flooding over the past two days. We've had more than 4,000 pictures, and please do keep sending them in. The latest show the huge disruption caused by Monday's torrential rain across the Midlands and Yorkshire. These pictures are of a salvage yard in Aldwickler Street in Doncaster. People crossing the street here in Hillsborough. Not even the deceased have been spared, as this graveyard near Tenbury shows. And finally, this fish is making the most of a garden-turned-pond in Stockbridge, Sheffield. Other news now, and two more people have been stabbed to death in London and Essex overnight. A teenager was killed after being involved in a disturbance on this street in Islington. And a man in his 20s was found by police and paramedics collapsed in a street in Ilford in Essex. It's the latest in a spate of such killings in England. 
Doctors have voted in favour of giving women quicker access to abortions in early pregnancy at the British Medical Association's annual meeting. Voted in favour of removing the need for the signatures of two doctors for abortions before 13 weeks. But the government says it has no plans to make any changes to the 1967 Abortion Act. And some news just in. In the last few minutes, Labour and Plaid Cymru have said they want to form a power-sharing government for Wales. The coalition would have to be agreed by special conferences of both parties, but would give Plaid Cymru its first ever ministers in the Assembly. Let's have a look at the weather now with Thomas Schaffernacker. Thomas. Sophie, thank you. It's not necessarily good news.